Arjuna Alfieri from Alamar, Ontario, Canada, speaks about Swami Vishnu Devananda as he was staff in the early 80s. Hariyam Tatsat. Morning. Be brilliant. Om Sahana Baba Tu Sahano Buddha Tu Sahara Vidyam Karavavaha Tejasvina Madhita Mastu Madhvidri Shavahi Om Shanti 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 Om Peace Om Bol Sakru Shivnanam Rajki so the topic was supposed to be given by Venu. Venu left and Venu plays harmonium. So we wanted to do some chanting and talk about Swami Vishnu with Swami Vishnu's favorite songs. And I thought that's a great idea. So I'm going to continue. Uh, I'm going to continue that topic. Actually, in the Bahamas. I give a, one course about Swami Shivananda and his philosophy through his songs. You know, serve, love, give, meditate, realize. That's a purify, meditate, realize. So, uh, first off, I must say that uh, I had a hard time with Swami Vishnu. I didn't have an easy time with him whatsoever. With him. We didn't have an easy relationship. But Swami Vishnu had different relationships with different people. So, uh, my wife and I were with him for, for, for many years together. So, his relationship with my wife was father-daughter relationship. So we were in Montreal Center, we'd come up here every uh, weekend when Swami Vishnu was in residence. And Kumari would bring him a little gift. And I remember when we, we didn't have any money whatsoever. There's no money in the organization you know, in those days. So there's an Indian store in Montreal near the center, Harjis it was called, and lychee nuts were in it. And, and Kumari knew that Swami Vishnu loved lychee nuts. So we went up and she got a little tiny paper bag about this big, full of lychee nuts. So before we leave, we go to Swami Vishnu's house. And so we, could, we had, and we knock on Swami Vishnu's door. Well, Kumari knocks on Swami Vishnu's door, and I'm hiding behind her, as I usually did, because I wasn't afraid of it. And she, he answers the door, and he goes, Oh, Kumari, how are you? And Kumari goes, Oh, Swamiji, I have some lychee nuts for you. And Swami Vishnu reaches behind his back, and I only come with a flower. Oh, Kumari, I have a flower for you. That's a relationship. Then he looks over Kumari's shoulder at me and he goes, Kumari, who's that guy with you? And that's what he said every time he saw me. Who's that guy with you? I get mad. Man. So, uh, so from, for me, like I, I needed a lot of discipline in my life and Swami Vishnu was a discipline giver for many of us. So the days when I came to the camp here, there was a, a bank robber on staff, uh, uh, a recovering heroin addict on staff. Um, there was a, a murderer that was taking a teacher training course. This is all people that came and so I wish we accepted all of these people. So it was a very uh, diverse group of people. And so I wish he was strong enough to take us all under his his wing. Uh, so, I have, uh, the first time I met Swami Vishnu, I was expecting a tall, handsome guru like man. And I found a short guy with a squint eye was yelling a lot. <laughs> so he didn't meet my expectations. And it took me like five years to get over my first impression of Swami Vishnu. You know? So, what was the first thing I heard? Well, Swami, not the first thing I heard Swami Vishnu say, but the first thing I heard Swami Vishnu say at a satsang. So I'm in the Bahamas, 
in the month of February, there's nice mockingbirds singing down there, beautiful sunrise. We just had a meditation, and I got a little afraid because we're singing Hare Rama and Hare Krishna, and I thought I had come to a cult and I would be selling Bhagavad Gita the next uh, moment at the uh, airports or something. But it's a beautiful Sunday. Swamiji said, first thing he said is, what day is it today? Yeah. And many people said, Sunday. Some said, no, one day closer to death. And he almost said that almost every day. What day is it today? I always fool people that always say, Thursday, no, one day closer to death. And I just hated to hear that. I mean, like, I'm in the Bahamas, I'm here to have a good time. What happened? One day, closer to death, who wants to hear that? So, uh, this is, I'm gonna, uh, you, I'm gonna share a couple of chant books here. We're gonna, uh, we're gonna sing this. Uh, so, I don't know what Vinod was gonna sing as, one of Vishnu's favorite uh, bhajans. But you, you can slide over there, you can, you can share this book. Uh, and this is dialogue. Swami Vishnu would do this sometime right during the Kirtan. And I would say, from my point of view, this actually uh, chant was written by Swami uh, Shivananda. And, and the funny thing, so here's how I learned to chant. So I was really afraid of chanting. I really was afraid that I had come to a cult. Because if I, I had done meditation before, I had done asanas before, but I had never done chanting before. So that was the hardest, hardest thing for me. So uh, I would sit there, and Swami Vishnu had quite an Indian accent. And, Gopala can tell you because he's trying to transcribe uh, uh, some of Swami Vishnu's talks and it's really hard. He talks very fast and even, even sang with an Indian accent. So in those days I was very cynical. So when Swami Vishnu would sing with his Indian accent, I would actually imitate his Indian accent. So I'd sing back with a fake Indian accent, you know. And I thought I was being really comical and that was my way of protecting myself from chanting, you know. And uh, I remember, uh, oh man, there used to be a, a different temple right here. And it was a, uh, a geodesic dome in the same location. That was our Krishna temple with the same Krishna statue, much smaller than this one. And your voice would really echo funnily in there. And I was uh, Swami Vishnu and the secretary, Swami Kartikeya. And uh, Swami Vishnu was singing and I was imitating in my Bach Indian accent, and Swami Kartikeya kept on turning around. Turning around. And she's like looking at me and looking at me. So after the, uh, after the satsang, she said, Arjuna, was that you singing like that? And I went, yeah, I said, finally I caught it. Yeah, that was me singing like that. She said, oh, you sounded just like an Indian. She said, you should help me with, I'm doing the chanting for the TTC. Will you help me teach the chants? And I said, I can't do that. <laughs> so anyway, uh, whenever, uh, so the funny thing is, so I learned some of these chants with an Indian accent. And uh, after Swami Vishnu died, they really, singing them with a the fake Indian accent is the way I learned them. So I, I kind of try to sing them the same way. So this was the song that I probably hated the most. It's on page uh, 14 on that book. It's, is, not, is there not a nobler mission? So we're singing right during the Hari Rama. You know, when we, we do Jaya Ganesha, we do Hari Rama, Hari Rama, Rama Rama. Oh, yeah, actually, let's do that. We're going to we'll start from the Hari Rama, and then we're going to actually, uh, this gets put in the middle of Hari Rama. So let's do two rounds of Hari Rama. You know that from your, your, your chanting and meditation, okay? Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna. 
Is there not a nobler mission than eating, drinking, and sleeping? So Swamiji would say, you know, that's our animal nature. 
procreation as well, part of our animal nature. None of those, all of those things, animals do. Yes. So that, is there more to life than our animal nature? And he would say, of course, yes. It is difficult to get a human birth. So Swami Vishnu used to talk much about reincarnation, karma, one of his main uh, issues. So, uh, so to get a human birth is a real different thing. He says there's many souls wanting to incarnate. And he said that we just to even hear the word yoga in an incarnation start you on the path of spiritual enlightenment. So he thinks that everyone that comes to the yoga camp or what did a teacher training course or whatever had had yoga in their past life. So he says, therefore try your best to realize in this birth. So we have to keep working at it. And it wasn't easy. So Swami Vishnu, see remember I, I said earlier that um, I, I didn't really see Swami Vishnu. He didn't look like I thought he was looking. It's because he didn't look like I thought a guru should look like. Uh, he would not, uh, I couldn't accept him as a guru. So he gave this many times, you know, because I, I saw him speak mm, dozens and dozens and dozens of times, you know. And often I'd be sitting there right in front of him and he'd take off his orange dhoti that he had around his shoulders and he'd wrap that dhoti around his head yeah? and he'd put his hands up like that. And he'd say, ah, now do I look like a guru? Now do I look like a guru? And I was always laughed because I always thought he was talking to someone else. It took me a long time mm. to figure it out that he was talking to me or the other people like me because I couldn't accept him because of the way he looked. You know, it seems strange. But that's the way our, our first impressions are, 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 really, are really hard. And then, you know, uh, all this talk about one day closer to death and things like that. I didn't want to hear that, you know. I was 33 years old or something. Now I'm 63, so now I, I know I can understand more what he's talking about. I'm lucky I made it those 30 years to understand. But I'm, I was a very, very uh, slow learner. So uh, now, the next part, how can you expect real Shanti if you waste your time in cards and cinemas, in cards and novels, in scandal backbiting and idle gossiping? You know, we start to, to think about this. You know, how much of the talk that we do is, is gossiping? You know? uh, fair amount. You know, uh, I, I live with a yogi. My wife, Kumar, is a yogi. And she keeps on telling that's gossiping. I said, no, no, it's not gossiping. That's gossiping, you know. So she tells me, so I have a... A controller to tell me what's gossiping and not because sometimes we just think we're talking nicely about other people but she doesn't think so but you know um, such a such a part of our life now is like novels and cinema and television you know and you know I uh, sports you know watching soccer on TV or something so many people spend their days doing this stuff. And I, I spent years of my life watching baseball games on TV until I cut myself out of the addiction, you know. So many of my students, and myself as well, some days we can't find 10 minutes in our day to do yoga. But we have time to watch a half hour TV show that has 10 minutes worth of commercials buying soap bubbles or something, you know. How can we can't find time minutes to do 10 rounds of Analoma Vloma, you know? So a lot of our time, it, ju it, just, it just sneaks by us. So time just, it, it just sweeps us away. And Swami Vishnu wanted to re remind us all of the time about that. So then it'd say like, where is Napoleon, ne Nehru? Kennedy, Gandhiji, of course they're all dead, as Swami Vishnu himself is, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, you know, are we, are we uh, immortal? Are we different than anyone else? It doesn't matter how strong we are. 
So we don't like to hear that. So how do you get around it? Then they say, be up and doing yogic sadhana, you will attain immortality. Does that mean you're not going to die? Maybe. Supposedly there's some immortals out there, but it means that uh, probably you get to come back as a yogi again. Be up and doing japa and meditation, you will attain supreme peace. Be up and doing asana pranayama, you will attain, attain supreme health. So these are all things that Swami Vishnu brought to the West and brought to his disciples and I keep on getting passed on and on and on. So when I did my teacher training with Swami Vishnu, there are up to 27,000 teacher trainees now. Almost 28, 27, eight is the number. And I was around number 7,000. In, in my teacher training, they went from 6,999 to 7,000 in the, in the numbers. That so was the teachers my, trained? It was my teacher training course when I was or trained. 27,000 teacher training, so 27,000 teachers people, trained. People, people have been trained. graduated. have been trained as teachers, yeah. They do 49 of them a year, courses. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I was around number 7,000, I was in the Bahamas. So I, I, I kind of a, an interesting guy, because we were always afraid of someone who was in the back and he says, he yells out during the graduation, 7,000, 7,000 yoga teachers. What are you ever going to do with 7,000 yoga teachers? This man says right out loud, you know, so Vishnu's there and Reverend Hepburn's there. And like, it kind of, I thought that was kind of neat because I, you know, people, it was kind of, seemed like a little disrespectful, the guy that <coughs> said that, but it, it was a good, it was a good question because in, in 1982, yoga was not <coughs> popular. There weren't, you know, didn't seem there was need for thousands of yoga teachers. And so what Vishnu said to that man, he said, 20 years from now, so that would be 2002. Mm -hmm. He said that in every city in North America, on the main corner, there was going to be a yoga center. He, you know, he said that in 1982. And I just shook my head and laughed. He said, he's crazy, you know. But, but he was absolutely correct. Yeah. Where I live in Ottawa, some places, some corners, there's four yoga centers uh, across from each other on every corner, you know? Uh, it really happened. And he knew it was gonna happen. He said it was gonna happen, you know? So there was many things that Swami Vishnu said that, that came to pass. So Swami Vishnu started this thing called TWO, True World Order. With TWO, that was a. Uh, it, it was only. It, it, I don't know. There might have been TWO T-shirts, but it never. You know, there was never meetings of TWO. But he said he started this full world order, and because he had a, a vision when he was when he first went to the Bahamas, you know, he taught all of the yoga. He cooked there. It was just a little place. He lived in a tree house. <coughs> he slept in a tree. He had a tree house in the tree in the Bahamas when he first went there. And he was in that tree house and he had this vision of this big fire and the world being engulfed in flame. And that's when he started the True World Order and that's when he started the teacher training course. Because he said that when you're trained as a, a, a teacher, that the training is to make you a, a leader in your community. Because it's probably going to be the politicians, the political leaders, that are going to cause the problem that's going to make the world burn. Mm -hmm. and, and they won't have any answers. So we said, you know, your people are going to be looking to spiritual people amongst them, the yoga teachers. So he was trying to train leaders for when whatever happens, happens. Um, an interesting thing he said. I, I love this thing because I use it all the time because they give headstand workshops. So Swami Vishnu said that when the world turns upside down, only people that can stand on their head are going to know what to do. <laughs> he actually said that. I mean, wow, that was, I had such a hard time standing on my head. I stood on my hands. So that's good. It's a good reason to stand on your head. So when I'm telling people about uh, uh, 
and I'm telling people uh, uh, in my headstand workshop about reason to do the headstand, this is one of the reasons that I use because Swami Vishnu says, when the world turns upside down, only people in that stand on their head are going to know what to do. But he would also, he also told us about the headstand. We, so, you know, uh, I also studied with Swami Satchitananda. And Swami Satchitananda, his big posture was the shoulder stand. He was just so kind and gentle, you know, it was hard for people to do the head stand. So wait for the advanced level. So they had your beginner's level, the intermediate level, advanced level. You had to be with Swami Satchitananda three years before you got on that, into the head stand. Swami Vishnu, on the other hand, he wanted to teach uh, people as soon as they came into the beginner's course to stand on their head right away. And we always would do that at the Shivananda Center. So I still teach Shivananda Yoga. I have an affiliate center. I don't teach people not in the intermediate, in the beginner's course anymore to do the headstand. It's uh, people have changed over the last 30 years. I, I, from from my point of view, you know, they'll just run away from yoga. You ask them to stand on their head, they'll never come back to a yoga class. Mm -hmm. They have to really trust you. It takes months and months of trust before you can get the people to stand on their head. But so, so Vishnu wanted us to start uh, with people in the in the beginner's course. Why? Why do you think he wanted to start people standing on the head the first time you meet them, stand them on their head? Hmm? I have no idea. Yeah. He said it's the gate to human potential, standing on your head. And I used to ask students, so Swami Vishnu said that most people, and I used to, back in the uh, 80s when I was teaching, uh, here's how I, I teach the head step. I, I, you know, on the third or fourth week of the beginner's course, after the people did the leg lifts and they were doing the relaxation, I would sneak up into my head stand where they were in Shavasa. Mm -hmm. And then from, from on my head, I would go, oh. Now it's time to sit up. So bring your feet together, stretch your arms back overhead, lengthen the spine, sit up, and we're going to do a new posture. And I'd be saying this from my head. And then they'd all sit up and they'd go, oh, oh, oh. you know. <laughs> and so, uh, I asked the question, how, how many people here are afraid to do this? And how many people here think that they could never do it? And it's about 75% of people would either be afraid to do the headstand or think that it was impossible for them to do it. And Swami Vishnu said that um, it's really an easy thing to, to learn. It's an easy thing to teach. And by te teaching this to people as soon as we meet them in the beginner's course changes their life. Because he said, what stops us from reaching our full potential? Two things, fear and negativity. And for people faced by the headstand are either faced by fear, I'm afraid to do that, I'll break my neck, or negativity, I could never do that. And so we said by teaching them that, as soon as we meet them, you know, as soon as we can, as soon as we meet them, that we can change their life. Because so many things we're afraid of. You know, fear and negativity stops us from doing so many things. So teaching the headstand, and this thing that they get that so afraid of, uh, and they can do and see that it's easy, maybe other things in their life are going to be easy as well. So uh, another, if so when I'm teaching headstand workshops, so many people ask, can I use the wall? Can I use the wall to do headstand? And uh, the answer is no. You can't use the wall. And so Vishnu had a neat reason. He, he had two reasons why not to use a wall in the headstand. Well, and he did, this was, this is my reason, but it's not one of Swami Vishnu's two reasons. My reason is that uh, most people that get injured doing the headstand are doing it against the wall. Mm -hmm. Because if they fall down, their head goes sideways and they really stretch their neck in a very weird way. You know, your bum hits the wall, your head goes sideways, <laughs> you're in pretty big trouble. That's why, what, but that's not why Swami Vishnu said not to do the heads. And he said these two things. He said one is the best place in the world to do the headstand is in the field of wild flowers. Mm -hmm. And I've done the headstand in a field of wild flowers 
and it is the best place, that also, uh, because he said that, it gives me permission to open my eyes when I do the headstand. So I open my eyes when I do, because I heard Swami Vishnu say that. You know? And uh, I, I do a lot of um, uh, cognitive work on myself by uh, doing the headstand with my eyes open. So in the Bahamas, we, we have a nice yoga dock. And I do my headstand on the yoga dock. And it's on Nasa Bay. And just down Nasa Bay, there's two bridges, and they're big, round bridges. Two of them. One draft goes in one direction onto the island, the other off the island. You know? So I stand on my head, and I do my headstand there. And I look, and I see, I, try, I stay in that, my headstand, and I can figure out which way the cars are going whether they're going onto the island or off of the island. And it's, it's amazing how difficult it is to figure that out. Mm. You, because uh, our brain has to work in a totally different way when you're upside down. And I really think that's one of the reasons that people are so afraid of doing the headstand. Because it changes your perception in such a way that it, it shakes you up. You're not sure. You know, like, I don't know which way is east and which way is west when I'm standing on my head. It takes me a long time to figure it out. Even though I do it every time, I still have to figure it out. I just go, <laughs> don't say that way is that one way once the other. <clears throat> so that's one reason. He said, do the best place to do the headstands is the field of wildflowers. So now you have to wait till next June until there's fields of wildflowers and, and try it again. And the other uh, reason he said is that you can trust no wall. He said, trust no wall. He said, the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. Any wall can come tumbling down. So don't trust any wall. Trust yourself. Don't trust the wall. That's what he said. He was teaching us self-sufficiency. So, so you're from Germany, so uh, the, it, it, uh, there's a, uh, there's a Munich uh, shooting on the center. Uh, so I'm going to tell this story. So, uh, for uh, four years, I was director of the yoga center in, in Montreal. I'd come up here all of the time on the weekends. And uh, then I got married to Kumari. And uh, after we were married, we got transferred up here to be on staff. And I became Swami Vishnu's accountant. And Kumari got in charge of the mailing list, which she hated. She had to sit there and type everyone's address onto labels all day. So anyway, as the accountant, and, and, and um, I told the story the other morning, Swami Vishnu always said he was a minus millionaire. No money, a minus millionaire. So, uh, he had this idea that the Berlin Wall had to come down. He said it was the biggest, most concrete divider of people. Because on some side of the Berlin Wall, the brothers and sisters were divided, cousins, aunts, and uncles divided. And he was Swami Vishnu, you know, part of his flying a plane was to be like a bird, so we could just fly over any border. And there's this wall, boom, right in the middle of Berlin. And he says, that wall has to come down. And he said, it can come down, because it's nothing but very solid energy that's vibrating. And we can change the vibration of the energy of that wall and it will fall down. So, here I am. Being a, uh, Swamiji being a minus millionaire and me being an accountant meant that all day, every day, I'm getting phone calls because if you're a minus millionaire, you owe money to people. So we owed money to people. It wasn't just like we owed the money to the bank. We owed <laughs> money to the uh, local lumber yard. We owed money to the food wholesaler. We owed money to Everybody, you know, and uh, it was hard, and I have trouble, like, with owing money, you know, so I have, like, this fear of being in debt and stuff. That's why he made me his cop. So, Swami Vishnu, this is, you know, uh, if, you, if you watch the Swami Vishnu Peace Mission movie, this beautiful thing, Swami Vishnu takes a little ultralight plane and he flies it over the Berlin Wall and he lands and everything's hunky-dory. He flies off into the sunrise and an East German farmer takes him 
He gets turned into the police, they give him a grilled cheese sandwich and he comes back and he gets lots and lots of publicity, you know? And a couple of years later, the Berlin Wall fell down. But, so that, that's, the, that's the romantic side of the story, is the Adam in the, in the background of the story. And this is a, a story about Swami Vishnu being a really positive thinker, you know? For, you know, he just didn't do this on a whim. Says so the Berlin Wall has to come down. You know, he had to meditate on it. He prayed to Swami Shivananda. Is this a good thing? You know, and then the message came through. Bring down, you know, get the Berlin Wall. It's a good thing. So he has his idea how he's going to do it. So how am I going to change the energy of the Berlin Wall? So the first thing he thought of was fire. Fire to burn the impurities of the Berlin Wall. But first he needed a place to do this. So he called a Swami Dogananda over in Germany. And Swami, he says, I need a place along the Berlin Wall to have this big peace festival in Berlin. So she scouts around up and down the Berlin Wall and she finds an abandoned uh, fairground, you know, where there's like a Ferris wheel and stuff like that, right along the wall. And it was, there was nobody there, and she could rent that thing for a week. I think it was, <laughs> I, I, I forget the number, it was either $14,000 or $40,000 to rent this favor. Somebody says, go rent it. Okay, so they rent this favor. So then Swamiji wants special fire walkers to come. Mm -hmm. you know, you, he wanted to have fire walking in front of the in front of the wall to change. And also, you want fire walking to, you know, wake people up. It's possible to do anything, you know. So he just doesn't want any fire walkers. Up in North India, there's a family of fire walkers that've been fire walkers for 14 mm -hmm. generations. These are the preeminent Indian fire walkers. So he gets someone from the uh, ashram in India to go up into the mountains and find this family of fire walkers and they get this head fire walker guy and he agrees to go to Berlin to do a, a fire walking thing. So now we got this fly this guy from Berlin uh, to from in, uh, Delhi to uh, Berlin. Except this guy can't do it by himself. He's training two assistants and he needs two assistants. So he needs his other two guys to come with him. So now we got three year fairs from Delhi to Berlin. Well, it turns out for them to do the fire walking, just like we had Carvedi here right, a week or two ago, the guys have to fast and pray for uh, three days before. Uh, uh, and then when they're fasting, they, they fast on goat's milk. And they can't do anything. They can't do anything. They just have to just sit in the shade. So they needed goat's milk. So they have to bring their wives and they need a special kind of goat's milk. So they need to bring their goats. Okay. So I'm sitting here in the office with all these phone calls and I get, you know, it's all of a sudden there's one guy, it's three guys. Now it's three guys, three wives, three goats. And then it turns out that during the fire walking ceremony, they have a 20 foot long horn. It's just a, a straight horn. 20 feet long, and they blow on the thing. It looks kind of like uh, those uh, Gubenzalias or whatever they use during the Olympics, you know, those plastic horns. But it's 20 feet long. It makes a great sound. <laughs> like that, you know, they blow that during the whole thing. So I got, you know, three guys, three wives, three goats, and a horn. And like, and the, the, the rent for this place. Now, Swamiji knew that the, uh, the, West Berlin uh, authorities did not want them flying over the wall. They just thought it was going to cause an international incident. It was going to be too big. Now, Swamiji had an ultralight plane that cost 20,000 bucks. You know what he did? He bought a second one as a decoy. So he had an ultralight plane that was out in plain view, and the West Berlin police were following it around everywhere he went. But he had another one. The one he actually flew wasn't the one the police. So that's two ultralight plates, that's 40,000. So I'm just looking, I'm just seeing cash register, you know, bring, bring, bring. It's 
it's like it was one hundred and sixty thousand dollars, you know. So I go to Swami Vishnu and I say, Swamiji, we can't do this. And he says, we can't do what? I said, this whole Berlin Wall thing, you know, we can't do it. He says, Arjuna, how long have you been with me? And I thought, I said, four and a half years, Swamiji. He said, you have learned nothing, nothing, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. It was true. I had learned nothing, nothing, nothing. So he, everything went on to the American Express. So then, after, the, and he didn't take me to, he invited all the staff to go to Germany here. I was accountant at the international organization. Did I get invited to go? No. Huh. I didn't get invited to go. Why? Negative thinker. That's why he didn't want me around. He didn't want my energy around. So, uh, The whole thing went off well. The bills came due. The very day that the bills were due, no money to pay them. None. None. There's a guy here, and I, I think he's around. I haven't seen him yet. He's named Bharata. He lives up on Sama. He, sometimes he's at the front desk, sometimes he cooks here. Lebanese guy. Now, he had been my student in Montreal, and uh, for a couple of years, and when I got transferred up here, he had never been here, but he liked my yoga class, so he wanted to come and take my yoga class. So he came up here on Saturday when I was teaching, and uh, in that evening, Swami Vishnu gave satsang, and Bharata had just like, his mouth dropped when he heard Swami Vishnu talk, and he just went, he like, it just changed his life, just sitting and hearing one talk from Swami Vishnu. He thought this was the greatest guy ever. So, so uh, Bharat was an uh, uh, immigrant from Lebanon, and he ran a depanur in Montreal, a little corner store where they sell like milk and Coca-Cola and newspapers and cigarettes and lotto tickets and things like that, beer. Actually. And he would work. Uh, his store was open from 6 a.m. to midnight every day. And him and his wife were there seven days a week guy working to the bone, you know, like a, his wife would take over so he could come to do yoga class because he was dying from all of the work he was doing. But he won the lottery and he won $80,000. The day that the money was due, I didn't know he won the lottery, he came here with $80,000 and he gave it to Swami Vishnu. The exact same day in Munich, a woman won the lottery of $80,000. She thought Swami Vishnu was doing great things. She didn't need the $80,000. She brought it to the Munich Center. The day the bills were due, $160,000 came in and everything was paid. Now, I, tell this, I told this story in the Bahamas and there's a Swami from Germany called Swami Anatananda. Anatananda. And Swami Anatananda, he was sitting there and I said, I know Bharata personally. And he says, I know the woman in Munich. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a, it's, this is a true story. So this is the way Swamiji worked. He, you know, he saw something that needed to be done or he felt it was important to do. And he'd just do it. And he was like a fireball. He was like a comet. You know, everything that was needed to support that action just came in after. You know, if you're doing the right action, you don't worry about the money. If you're worried about the money, this is why I had learned nothing, nothing, nothing. I'm worried about the money. He's worried about the, the fate of humanity. You know, I'm worried about a few dollars, you know? But I didn't get it. I didn't get it for a long time. So he was, he was really a positive thinker. So I, I'm, gonna tell you another, I'm gonna tell you a story about negative thinking. And uh, this is another story that I have. It's not one of my, my highlights of my life, but uh, again, I had Swami Vishnu. So you got to figure this. Swami Vishnu is coming from India, and he has a system called a Guru Kula system. And the Guru Guru Kula system, from our Western perspective, is like a dictatorship. Hmm? The Guru is always right. You never say the, no to the Guru, but the Guru tells you to do, you do. 
I was thinking, I'm coming from hippie days, you know, long hair, ponytail, big beard, and stuff like that, you know. And part of the thing of hippie days, you were just anti-establishment, you know. But so many of the people that came here were hippies and got into following orders and anti-establishment. Somebody said, like, you guys, you know, you just think because you come to an ashram, you can, you can you know, stay up all night, get up at one o'clock in the afternoon, and then because you're here with Swami Vishnu, you're going to get enlightened? No, you have to work. You know, that's why all of the bells and everything here, you know, we, we had to come. You, know, you can't just, nobody can do it for you. So there was, there was a, uh, another Swami around at the time with a peacock feather. And people used to line up and then this guy would hit him off the head with the peacock feather and they were supposedly getting uh, divinely realized because they were hit with this Shakti pot. Somebody said, does it work like that? You have to do it yourself. You have to do your own work. So, you know, I had many friends in the organization. Maybe you say, how, you know, if it was so hard, how could we stay for five years? One, the camaraderie between the staff members was wonderful, you know. Plus, we were doing lots of yoga, and yoga makes you feel good, you know. Like, it was almost like Swami Vishnu was the... Uh, was the fly in the ointment. Everything else here was great. For, from my point of view, not, this is not everyone's point of view, you know. So, uh, Swami Vishnu had many people, there were long-time staff members, friends of mine, that would say no to him for, for some reason or another. You know, uh, Swami Vishnu would just say, you know, uh, there's a Swami from uh, Spain, Swami Shiva Jyoti. Really nice guy. One, he was here one year in the 80s and he had a uh, problem with the disc in his back. He had 95 people come from Spain. There were like 140 people from, for, at the teacher training here. 95 were from Spain. And he was their teacher. So he came and he taught the whole class on a piece of plywood, leaning on a piece of plywood. That's the only way his back could get comfortable. So he's there like... Like he would be here, you'd leave the police, and he'd give his whole lecture, like lying on a piece of plywood. Like, like <laughs> God, it's amazing. So, uh, he had been in, uh, it was just before the Berlin Wall thing. So, uh, he had been working with the Spanish government for many, many years to have a camp for juvenile delinquents. Instead of sending these young people to jail, like teenagers to jail, he had this idea, we're going to bring them to a yoga ashram and we're going to teach them karma yoga, we're going to teach them asanas, we're going to teach them pranayama, we're going to teach them positive thinking with the same things we were learning. So after years of working with the government, getting donations from all kinds of people, finally he had matching funds from the Spanish government. So if he could raise $100,000, the Spanish government was giving him another hundred thousand dollars. It was great, and this guy was so excited, and it was all going to happen in the fall in September. And this is when the Berlin Wall thing was on, and Swamiji needed money, and he said to Swami Shiva Jyoti, uh, "You have a hundred thousand dollars, right?" Swamiji said, "Yes, yeah, Swamiji, the project's going to come off. We're going to start the land all set. We're going to start this." Who would you say? I need that hundred thousand dollars. Give me the hundred thousand dollars. And the guy's like face drop. He says, Swamiji, what, what do you mean? Give me the hundred thousand dollars. I need it. You, you give it to me. You, you're, you're in my organization. I'm the guru. I said, I want a hundred thousand dollars. You give me the hundred thousand dollars. And the guy said, no. I'm not going to give it to you. I've been working for years on this. I can't. This is my big life project. I can't give you this money. What he said? Yeah. Keep your hundred thousand dollars you're going by through mouth after years, after all of the work he had done. And I'm looking at this and I'm going, wow. You know, I'm always taking the guy at the side of the guy that's getting thrown out. I didn't understand the Guru Kula system, what it was about. He didn't understand, he didn't get it either. He was like me. If he had given Swamiji the hundred thousand dollars, he would have got it back. Mm -hmm. But he was too attached. He was attached to that. So when I saw things like that, I, I just left there like kind of shaking my head. I said, how could he do that to that guy? 
guys in pain. He's brought 95 students this year. Been with them for 14 years. He threw them out. So I'm, I'm telling people that story. I'm in Montreal and I'm shaking my head and I'm saying, how could anyone even want to hear Swami Vishnu talk? How would anyone be his disciple? How can anyone, you know, we yeah, want to hear, even want to hear this guy speak? You know? Just as I said that, the phone rang. Just them saying, pick up the phone. Shivananda Yoga Center. Who's that? He says, Arjuna. That's Swami Vishnu. I said, yeah. He said, I want to come to Montreal to speak. He says, you're in charge of the whole thing. He says, I want you. Rent the hall, do the advertising, do the whole thing. This is just after I said Nobody who would want to hear this guy speak. I get the phone call like this the, in the minute. You know, the minute. So I go, all right, so I'm going to be sure. You know, I go down and I look, he wants a room with 300 seats and all this. So I find the best bargain on a place. Like add in the newspaper, add on the radio, you know, talk it up to our, our students at the center. But you know, my heart really wasn't in it. But I did it. So, uh, one of our, our students was a photographer, Eduardo Blanco, and his, and his uh, girlfriend had done her teacher training. Kamari was at the center with me and my partner at the center. So we go down to the hotel. Um, Swami Vishnu came with a car full of five people from the yoga camp. Seat of 300 people seated. We were the only ones there. Not one other person came. Hmm. That's the power of negative thinking. Yeah? So Swami Vishnu, with like nine of us there, I think there was nine of us there all together, gave the whole talk like the place was full. So we're there with the, all of these empty seats, and he gives the whole talk. And then during my teacher training, you know, uh, you have to learn physiology. You know? And I couldn't be bothered with some of the stuff. And, you know, there's uh, movement of the joints called adduction, abduction, and flexion. You know? So, you know, I said, why would you have to learn those words? Because you're never going to tell anyone to abduct their wrist. Who's going to know that or adduct their arm? No one's going to, you don't use those words. You know, I, don't, I didn't learn them, so I didn't really know what they were. Adduction, abduction, and flexion. So, I mean, he says, okay, now Arjuna is going to come up and he's going to demonstrate Adduction, abduction, and flexion. So he says, Arjuna, put out your arm. And he said, abduction. And it was I don't know. Adduction. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Flexion. Didn't know. So he's sitting in the chair. I'm standing right beside him. And uh, he grabs my arm and he pulls it down. And he, he takes it and he's like twisting it behind my back. I look totally terrified. Swamiji's looking at me, totally fierce, and the photographer took a picture. So that's the, that's the picture of my time with Swamiji. He's like twisted my arm behind my back. That's what he had to do with me. You know? That was like our relationship. So, you know, but, but Swamiji, he was a positive thinker. And, it, and it's hard, you know, it's easy to be a negative thinker. Really easy. Even, you know, I, see my ne I can see my negative thinking now. But I see it, but it, I can't stop it. My first reaction to almost anything is negative, but then I can catch it, and then I can oh, that's the way my mind works, and then I can flip it around. So anyway, it's uh, 3 o'clock. So we're going to sing another. For me, this is, uh, uh, this morning, if you were at satsang, Shivdas Chaitanya sang Monday Guru Day, and I sang it yesterday. So that was one of Swamiji's favorite songs. But the other one was right under that, so, and these new books are on page 17, and the old books are probably... Oh, that's, that's a good picture of Swamiji. Let me see that. Can I see that picture? This, this picture here of Swamiji, this is one of the ones that... Uh, and you see the original of that one. He can uh, either uh, sneer at you or uh, smile at you from, from, the same, from the same photograph. So I used to have one of these. It used to scare me because a lot of the time he wasn't too happy with me. Today he's not too happy with you, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just looked at it. Oh, I'm in trouble. But anyway, after, uh, after uh, 
Jaya Ganesha, Swamiji would often sing, almost like part of Jaya Ganesha, Yamanati Ravi Hari. And we're going to finish this with that song. It's a nice song. So, it's a call and response. Yamunati Ravi Hari Vrindavana Sanchari Yamunati Ravi Hari Vrindavana Sanchari Govardhana Giridari Gopal Krishna Murari Govardhana Giridari Gopala Krishna Murari Dasarata Nandana Ram Ram Dasamukta Madana Ram Ram Dasarata Nandana Ram Ram Dasamukta Madana Ram Ram Vashupati Ranjana Ram Ram Papa Vimochana Pashupati Ranjana Ram Ram Pashupati Ranjana Ram Ram Mani Maya Bhushana Ram Ram Manjula Bhashana Ram Ram Mani Maya Bhushana Ram Ram Manjula Bhashana Ram Ram Rana Jaya Bhishana Ram Ragukula Bhushana Ram Ram Rana Jaya Bhishana Ram Ram Ragukula Bhushana Ram Ram Yamunati Raviyari Vrindavana Sanchari Yamunati Raviyari Vrindavana Sanchari Murari Govardhana Giridari Gopala Krishna Murari Let me just tell one story that Swamiji used to tell. I usually tell it at the bottom part. I guess I'll tell it at the bottom part. Sing the last half of Om Triam Kam Chant together. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamada Chati Purnasya Purnamada Purnameva Vashi Chati Om Shanti 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 Yeah. Vishnu Nandarajaki. Yeah. Um, so enjoy your afternoon. Thank you for coming in and hearing a little bit of the stories this morning.